Okay. You know what I'm making the film about? No. About anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, what does that mean? It means when people hate uh, the Jewish people. No way, man. The Jewish people control the war. Yeah? Of course. Being an Israeli Jew, I have never experienced anti-Semitism myself, but it's a phrase that always seems to be in the air. Three words seem to appear over and over again. Holocaust, Nazi, anti-Semitism. Living in a country that was founded to give the Jewish people a safe place to live in, I found this really disturbing. So I decided I wanted to learn more about the subject. Ladies and gentlemen. This is Abe Foxman, the head and face of the Anti-Defamation League. I have been um, lucky to have survived by miracle to show up. The ADL is the biggest organization in the world fighting anti-Semitism, with a budget of over 70 million dollars a year. Abe Foxman has become the symbol of the fight against anti-Semitism in the world today. I thought he might be able to open some doors for me. So I asked him to help me out with my film. Abe Foxman was very welcoming. I think he liked the idea of an Israeli filmmaker taking an interest in anti-Semitism. And he agreed to give me unprecedented access to his organization, which has its headquarters in Manhattan. He's doing a film, which I still don't understand what it is, but, but we said yes, yes, and yes. You're on the record. Got it. Okay? I'll be good. Okay? He's not going to hurt us. Great. On the other hand, he's a, he's a good journalist, okay? Great. I'll take he care He wants of to get, you know, good stuff. Foxman introduced me to some of the senior staff at the headquarters. Yeah, you can talk to him too. Would you say the ADL is like the biggest uh, Jewish organization dealing with anti-Semitism? Oh, yes, yes. In, in the world. Yeah, there's no question about that. Yeah, certainly in the United States, but I would say in the world. We have all of our 27 offices all over the country with their ears to the railroad tracks. It starts with an insult, a denigrating statement, and at the very top, what, it is, what you have is genocide. And in between is every bad thing that can happen to somebody. This is my grandmother. She's over 90 years old, and she lives in Jerusalem. I decided to tell her about the film I am making. I'm Israeli, okay? I never felt like it was anti-Semitism. So I asked, what is it? I'm trying to understand what it is. Her family emigrated from Russia in the 19th century because of the strong Zionist ideology. The first Zionists came to Israel, or Palestine as it was then, because they thought it was the only solution to anti-Semitism. הם אוהבים כסף, יהודי אוהב כסף. יהודי זה רמאי. יהודי זה רמאי. והוא עושה שם כסף, למה לא לבוא פה ולעבוד, אם הוא יכול לעשות שם כסף בלי לעבוד? למה לא? שם הם לא עובדים? הם לא עובדים. זה שאני אומרת. שם יש להם כסף בלי לעבוד. פה הם יעבדו, יצטרכו לעבוד. איך יש להם כסף בלי לעבוד? אה? איך... איך יש להם כסף בלי לעבוד? 
איך עשו כסף? ריבית, מלווה בריבית, ו... ובתי מרזח פה, ויין פה, וזה שם. זה הם יודעים, יהודי יודע את הפוילשטיק האלה. יהודי יודע את הפוילשטיק האלה. אני אומרת לך, אני היהודייה האמיתית. לא כסף מסנוור אותי, שום דבר לא. אבל את מדברת כמו האנטישמים, שאומרים על היהודים שהם לא עובדים והם עושים... לא, את לא מדברת. אני אומרת, הם רוצים להיות שם, מה שיהיה בסבלם, שיהיה... עד שאולי יבוא מישהו, היטלר אחר ויהרוג, ותמי יברחו. מה? Tens of thousands of Israeli high school students fly to Poland each year to learn firsthand about the Holocaust, the worst genocide in human history, and the most terrible result of anti-Semitism. When I was in high school in the late 80s, there were less than 500 kids going on this trip in the whole country. Today, there are more than 30,000. I decided to join them on their journey and their initial preparation which takes place in Yad Vashem. אני דור שלישי לניצולי שואה ומהרגע הראשון שסבתא שלי סיפרה לי על סיפורים על השואה ראיתי את המבט שלה מבט שלא נש... לא נסלח ולא נשכח. וראיתי מה היא מרגישה, אבל לא הרגשתי את זה גם. זה בעיקרון מה שאני רוצה להרגיש במסע, את התחושה של הלא לסלוח ולא לשכוח. The kids are going through a longer preparation for the trip to Poland. The school counselor is in charge of their mental preparation. ותנסו באמת להבין את הקשר בין אז להיום. זאת אומרת, האנטישמיות זה דבר שלא נגמר. אולם, בעקבות השואה קמה מדינת ישראל, אבל אנטישמיות זה משהו שיש עד היום, וכל הזמן תקראו עיתונים, יש מקרים אנטישמיים לכל רחבי אירופה ובארצות נוספות. כך שאתם כיהודים, כדור העתיד, ככאלה שעומדים להתגייס לצבא, צריכים לפגוש גם את הצד הזה שלנו. מלבד זה, יוצא איתכם גם מאבטחים, יוצאים איתכם מאבטחים, המאבטחים לא יאפשרו לכם ליצור שום קשר עם האוכלוסייה המקומית. נפגשו שם אנשים שלא אוהבים אותנו. תראו, לא אוהבים אותנו, תחשבו שאתם סאלי. גם היום, אני אומרת לכם שוב, גם היום לא אוהבים אותנו שם. זה כאילו האיכות שלנו, שאתה יודע שאף אחד לא סובל אותך, אבל אתה גאה בזה. כאילו, מגדלים אותנו מגיל קטן על זה שאנחנו נדע שיש לנו שונאים. לא יודעת, על כל מיני דברים כאלה. ובעצם כשהילד יודע שיש לו שונאים, וש... כאילו מה שקרה בשואה לדורות הקודמים שלו, אז זה גורם לך איזה סוג של כעס לצד השני, כאב, כעס, אפילו שנאה. כולם יודעים ששונאים יהודים. זה משהו שגם גדלנו איתו, גדלנו איתו כזה, תמיד כזה היה שנאה ואנטישמיות. תמיד אני לא, אני לא זוכרת שפעם לא הייתה אנטישמיות. זה יחזק בי את הישראלית שבי, את הציונית שבי ואת היהודייה שבי, אין ספק. Yediot Achronot is the most popular and influential newspaper in Israel. I'm curious about the people behind the reports of anti-Semitism I read on a daily basis. I know it's a big deal when I say it, but everyone has a problem. Tzorfa is anti-Semit, Germany is anti-Semit, the countries in America are anti-Semit. I don't want to talk about the countries Muslim, I don't want to talk about it at all. הם למעשה כולם, ליטא נשארה אנטישמית, כל המדינות הבלטיות, אבל גם המדינות במערב, אנגליה היא אנטישמית. 
ללונדון יש ראש עיר אנטישמי מוצהר. זאת אומרת, הם כולם אנטישמים, רק כאמור, יש שקטים יותר ויש בוטים יותר. ולמה אני בכלל צריך להיות אובייקטיבי? הם היו אובייקטיביים? כלפינו לא, הם גם לא היו אובייקטיביים. מה זאת אומרת הסיפור הזה? אבל... אבל בתור עיתונאי זה... אין דבר כזה בתור עיתונאי. בוודאי שלא, לא במקרה כזה. בוודאי שלא במקרה הזה. אני הולך איתו כבר 65 שנים. אבא היה באושוויץ אחד, אני הייתי באושוויץ שלוש, ואימא הייתה באושוויץ שתיים בברקנאו. נוח is over 80 years old and is making sure that the future generation of reporters will be just as committed as he is. והנתון הזה מספק אותו, זה הגיע מסקר של הליגה נגד השמצה בארצות הברית, בהחלט שווה לתת לזה מקום די נרחב בעיתון. The headline in the Israeli paper was quite worrying. I wanted to see how the anti-defamation league actually fights anti-Semitism. What looks like a spike in uh, anti-Semitic and uh, racist um, activities or, or manifestations. Now, New York seems to be at the center, or at least getting the attention. How, where do you see it? How do you see it? Well, I've had a lot of meetings with the police department and last week with the mayor to talk about this. There is a wave. There's no question about it. I don't know if it's attached to the time of the year, I may be attached to the presidential election. I'm, I, I'm not quite sure why we're saying it here. Do you have enough uh, resources to, to deal with the, all the stuff? No, 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 no. We're flooded every day with these things all over the country. It's a very big problem. According to the ADL reports from the last couple of years, the average number of anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. is around 1,500 a year. I'm hoping Joy Levy can help me find a case I'll be able to follow. What I'd like to do is to follow a case. I understand, yeah. Because, you know, every film needs like uh, a drive. Yeah. Once we have like uh, a case that we can follow, so that, that would be great. We're going over the fresh data collected over the last couple of weeks to see if there's anything I will be able to film. We have received in the last week or so um, someone who <clears throat> employment case, someone who um, didn't, didn't, uh, wasn't able to take days off for the holiday, um, someone who um, is a school teacher and wanted days off for Shavuot, someone who is a nursing student and had some issues with taking time off as well as uh, with taking time off. Um, We also got a phone call from someone who was complaining about a website that had anti-Semitic um, remarks on it. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who was complaining about an article in the newspaper who they thought had anti-Semitic mm -hmm. anti undertones. Um, and I mean, that seems to be the roundup. And, and that, that's what we've had in the last two weeks. Two weeks. Those, are, those are the kinds of incidents that we've had recently. Five in two weeks. So you, you, there's no way to predict. There wasn't anything suitable from the last two weeks. So Joel Levy tries to help me to find a case. What they're looking for 
is an incident that they might be able, and they will do all the contact work, but an incident they might be able to follow to actually see something that has happened, to go to the site, to talk to people there, to show what has happened, the impact on them, how we interact with all of that, and so on. Assemblyman Hickend has a lot of Jewish voters in Brooklyn, and he suggested a case for me. You know, I had a very interesting case um, just last week. A woman went to a funeral in not too far from here, thousands of people, and she heard a police officer on the phone say something to someone else, something very derogatory about the Jew something to somebody. This woman was at the funeral. She heard this. She was so upset. She wrote me a letter. I, I could show you the letter. And she called me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is this the only letter? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you want me to read part of it to you? Actually, you yeah. could look at it. Uh, I overheard a very disturbing conversation that a policeman had on his cell phone. I heard him say very loudly, I wasn't even standing close to him, quote, I'm just finishing this Jewish shit. S sorry for using this kind of language, but this is the exact quote. I was so offended by the vulgar language, which is never appropriate, etc. And she goes on. I made it that the police officer called the woman. He apologized on the telephone. He can thought it was a good case, but the police wouldn't let the officer go on camera, and the Jewish woman seemed to be satisfied that the policeman had apologized. I realized that it might take some time to find a suitable case to film. And the kids had just finished their preparations, so I had to join them and fly to Poland. The man with the blanked out eyes is an Israeli secret service agent whose identity we are not allowed to reveal. Traveling around Poland today, it's hard to imagine what it must have looked like over 60 years ago. But the guides helped the kids to visualize and feel how it was under the Nazi regime. Yasmin, Yasmin, you are from our model of my mother, you are going to go to the top of the mountain and we will take you. You are a woman named Danka, who was also a woman here, and she was born here. היו זורקים אותם, ואתה יודע, היו מתחבים. אז לפי מה שהבנתי, אימא שלה נתפסה, והיא ניצלה. מה היו עושים הגרמנים? היו זורקים אותם מהחלון פה, אתה רואה? תסתכל. היו זורקים אותם, ואת החזקים שלהם היו מחפשים אותם, כי הם היו מתחבים מתחת לרחובות ובארונות. אני כאילו דנת עכשיו. בגטו לובלין, גטו יהודי בעיר לובלין. ישראל? לא תמוך בישראל, אל נתם גדש פויאט פוגיסקו. ימה שם שסקין נסתשתי. כתו גדו, ישראל צאני? פתאום שסקון, הדופטר יאק פוגיאם שישראלה, לא תמוך בישראל. אינגליש? הוא מדבר רעות על ישראל, הוא אמר שאנחנו כלבים. הבנתי. בואי כבר, את מדברת עם אחד כזה. שומר עלינו מה... אנטישמיות, מה... כאילו שומע, שלא יבואו מתנגשים או... כאילו יעשו לנו משהו בלי ש... את חושבת שזה יכול לקרות? 
כן, זה נכון. הרגע, היום בבוקר היינו שלושה אנשים מבוגרים יחסית, שרק שמו שאנחנו מסתכלים ודפקו לי פרצופים ואמרו שאנחנו קופים וחמורים ועוד שנייה, כאילו, היה מכות שם. הם לא אמרו שום דבר כזה. לא? לא. הם כן. לא? Although the days in the Poland trip are long and exhausting, the kids still have a lot of energy when they get back to the hotel. ZANG EN MUZIEK השבק, תשמע, הוא דפוק, הוא אכלו אוכלים בסבבה, פתאום הוא בא, יש לי כמה דברים, מסייע עדינות. אתה רואה כזה אחד כזה, אשכנזי חרוט כזה, פתאום הכי דרד לך על ליאו נאצי וזה, כולם היו בשוק, לא יכלו לסיים את האוכל. סך הכל בשביל הביטחון שלנו, אז כאילו, אסור לנו לצאת, אפשר אחרי ארוחת ערב, אנחנו צריכים להיכנס לחדרים. למה? כי הם אנטישמים. הם לא הכי אוהבים אותנו. בדיוק. אפשר רק להיכנסים לשדה תעופה, זה הכול יש שם חיילים, הולכים כמו משטר הנאצי. חיילים הולכים כזה, ישר כזה, As the kids were facing anti-Semitism in Poland, or at least feeling that they were, a case was reported in Brooklyn that seemed suitable for the film. According to the report, a Lubavitcher yeshiva school bus, full of young children, had been pelted with stones as it was making its rounds dropping off children. One of the stones had crashed through a window where one of the children was sleeping and landed in the aisle between the seats. A second stone broke a window and barely missed two other children. Two mothers witnessed the incident and gave descriptions of a group of black youths between the ages of 10 and 12. So were you scared? Uh -huh. Were you scared? I was worried for the kids. I was worried for the kids more than for me. What, all of a sudden you heard like a big noise? How was it? Big noise in two windows. Look. So the, the, the back? In the middle, on the side. And the kids started to shout or what? No, they were quiet. They were sleeping. The three year old was sleeping on the bus. He was going back from school. Crazy, huh? Crown Heights is a mixed neighborhood of Jews and blacks. In 1991, there was a lot of tension between the two communities, leading to the Crown Heights riots, which went on for three days and resulted in many casualties. This is Benjamin Lifshitz, the local reporter in Crown Heights. Maybe put your arms like, uh, you know? Hold it? Yeah? I'm not a poster boy. He was the first to report the incident. Not a big, strong guy. You see, they, where the rocks went into the bus over there. Wait, wait, can you, can you go back to that? And, I mean, most of the, like, of the crime incidents in Crown Heights are targeted at Jews? Uh, it's always been known throughout the course of history, Jews are soft targets. It's, we've been, we've been, uh, the victims of so many, so many uh, major incidents, genocides and catastrophes and holocausts and everything. It's just 
the way we are. We're, we, we've always been victimized. When, uh, when, a, when a black guy sees two people walking down the street, a black person and a Jewish person, his choice to attack someone will not be a black person. Because a black person, you never know. What is that guy? Does he carry a knife? Does he carry a gun? A Jew is a soft target. It's, uh, it's always been known like that, which is why we always encourage to walk in pairs, which is why we always, we don't walk so much outside, like um, at night, so to speak, alone. It's, uh, I thought I should speak with some of the blacks in the neighborhood to see what they feel about anti-Semitism. I mean, like, today we interviewed this guy and he told us it was going to be like uh, a Jewish guy and a black guy walking in the street and, yeah. you know, somebody wants to rob, they would go for the, like, the Jewish guy because like, he's an easier target. He's not actually, no, guy. he's wrong. He's not... They would actually go for the black they guy because black you guy. go for a Jewish guy, you get more time. You get more time. Like the, the lawyers, the judges will actually give us more time if we yeah, rob someone crime. of another race. They're going to classify so it as a hate crime. So that's why most blacks rob each other because you get less time. <laughs> So it's like a practical thing, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, and, a, it's a lot of wisdom behind and it. Honestly yeah. speaking, like, if you wanted to rob a Jewish person, like, why would you rob a Jewish person? Like, you don't never see them with nothing that would make you want to rob them. Like, yeah, especially them up there. They just, they, they basic, they, simple. They don't have nothing. And most people, like, how could you talk it out a Jew person, like, when all of them dress the same? Like, everybody dressed the same. They all look the same. So, and, I live I don't around know. here 35 years. I have never seen a Jewish person get robbed in this neighborhood. Never. But there are kind of incidents between blacks and Jews, right? There yeah, are some no, issues. Well, 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 it ain't really issues. It's like favoritism. They get treated better. Yeah, like the police treat better. them better. Yes, they do. If, 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 if I'm arguing with a Jew, the cops are going to come to me. They're not going to bother them. They're going to think I'm, a, I'm the aggressor. They're not going to think they're the aggressor. Because they already have like a perception that Jews are more holier than black people. Let me tell you something, another thing, you know, they're supposed to be so the chosen ones, but they be in a welfare office, in a Section 8 office, they're the first one to get uh, uh, any kind of bargain deal on anything. They're the first ones to get any kind of discount or uh, they know the system very well, okay? A lot of times they have all this money coming in the household, but somehow they always figure out a way to manage getting Section 8 or public assistance. Whatever oh. services is available, trust me, the Jewish people are the first ones to find but out about it. Speaking, they're like, the first ones to utilize it. Actually, you know? they're part of the mind control system that they use through television and the media. The higher up. That, that, that right there is in a book called The Elders of the Protocols of Zion. That was in like 1898. They was talking about how the Jews will use TV and media and propaganda to control the world and take over the world. So little things like that just, oh man, who wrote that book? I'm trying, it was a Russian who wrote that book too. Elders, whoever's watching this, Elders of the Protocol of Zion, read it. It gives you an idea, the blueprint to take over the world. It is. It's a, implementing it right now. <laughs> it's, it's actually, when you read it, they say it's false. But when you read it, you see everything coming to light. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion describes how a group of all Jews sit around the table plotting conspiracies to take over the world. But that's considered to be like a really anti-Semitic book, you know. It, it is anti-Semitic to serve. Anti it's really not anti-Semitic. It's, it's not anti-Semitic. It's this is like, wrong. people keep saying things and they really say, don't know what it. they're talking about. If, if somebody's it's telling, if somebody anti telling anti the truth, it's not anti if somebody's Semitic. telling the truth about something, why, why does it have to be anti-Semitic? Because it's not in, in the Jew, Jewish people's favor. It's not anti-Semitic. It's it just somebody about, being honest. Facts is what it is. Bottom line. No, but just to put things straight, like this book, the the, the books of the elderly of Zion. That was actually the they said it was written by a Jew, actually. So it's really not anti-Semitic. But this law, this 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 book was like kind of a fraud, you know. Yeah, they say it's a fraud. They there wasn't such a thing, you know. It's like a bunch of people sitting together running the world, you know. This is kind of bullshit, but you know. But you said that's bullshit. That like, he says that that that, that is this is not true. No, this is like a false book. That's that's not bullshit. As far as like nah, a bunch of see, people we, sitting no together running the world, the United now. Nations is a bunch of people sitting together running the world. So how could you say that's world? bullshit? No, it's different, you know, because. All right, so exactly, there's no difference. You said some like pretty hard stuff about like you know Jewish people and no, stuff no, like that. See, no, 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 Hold on, you listen, wait, no. No, let, let, let me finish. I mean, like, so maybe when they like see you guys on the streets and they feel like afraid or they feel tension, there is something, you know, like. That goes to what I was telling you before. They don't know no, us. Wait, they never what? took time to get to know us. She was telling you that they separate themselves from us. They don't so, want to know us. So when you don't want to get to know someone, but you honestly never... speaking, you can't, like, you can't. You, but like, you, you, you're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to manipulate the conversation. No, I'm just asking. I'm, no, I'm no, 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 because we told you we have no problem with them. Hold on. First of all, why, why wouldn't we be afraid of them also? There's a, a misunderstanding and there's a lack of communication. How do we know that? 
we're safe amongst them. I mean, not Talking with them made me realize that living in a mixed community can create a lot of tension that can be easily inflamed. I went to talk about the situation with Rabbi Hecht, one of the leaders of the Jewish community and commissioner for human rights. Even the attack on the school bus, not every time when somebody calls somebody with a name that you're a Jewish so-and-so or you're black so-and-so, does that mean that I am a racist in heart or an anti-Semite uh, anti in heart or that I'm doing it only because of anti-Semitism? If five crimes happen, five blacks against five Jews, oh, it has to be anti-Semitism. Why? Listen, even if the reason why I hit that Jewish kid is because I knew that he's not going to fight back, or the white woman in this neighborhood was a Jewish woman, I stole her pocketbook because I know it's going to be easy prey. That's not called anti-Semitism. Now, again, you want to put it into some category and lock the guy up for a longer period of time because he saw a weak woman that he grabbed it. But again, I think we have gone a little too far. Many of the anti-Semitic incidents reported by the ADL happen to Orthodox Jews, since they are the easiest to spot. So I was pretty surprised by Rabbi Hecht's response. Uh, let me tell you guys. I am suspicious when a guy makes a living from a particular situation. So if there's a particular film crew that make a living from blood, that's why I'm suspicious every time they show blood. If a guy is uh, created only because of anti-Semitism, I'm nervous about his uh, reports. Are they accurate? He has to create a problem because he needs a job. So you say, like, I mean, the ADL is not like a credible organization, or? Uh, I, I really can't pass judgment on other organizations, so uh, we'll leave it that way. I'll be politically correct. But, uh, but, but, listen, clearly the ADL has been responsible in certain areas to flare up things as much as they've, they've helped. Um, now of course, having said that now, I'm on the ADL's uh, blacklist now, so uh, Mr. Foxman is not going to come to my home for, for dinner, but what should I tell you? An important part of the ADL's work are the international missions, and Foxman decided to allow me to join him. Every year, a few ADL board members and contributors get to join Foxman as he travels to various countries, meeting heads of state, politicians, and other influential people who can help in the fight against anti-Semitism. It's like an organized tour, but apart from visiting museums and other tourist attractions, the chosen ADL members get to join Foxman in taking an active part in the struggle against anti-Semitism. You have to debate what is proportionate uh, when someone attacks you. You are serious people, and you're here for serious business, and you're going to see the Holy Father, and, and everything uh, the ADL does is serious business. The police escort along the way made me realize I was traveling with some pretty important people. I'm seeing the Pope tomorrow. Uh -huh. OD Friday. Oh, uh -huh. uh -huh. Good job. Beautiful. How gorgeous. I'm curious about how Mr. Foxman gets to meet all these important people. Why would all these ambassadors, politicians, and heads of state take the time to meet him. It's their perception of the power of the Jewish community, which is one of those signs of the anti-Semitism, which is it's a very thin line, you know. Um, they believe we, we are more powerful than we are. I've always said Jews are not as powerful as the Jews think we are, nor as powherful as our enemies think we are. We're somewhere in between. But um, they do believe, uh, to some extent, that we can make a difference in Washington, and we're not going to convince them otherwise. So how do you fight this sinister, conspiratorial view of Jews without using it? Look, when, when the United Nations comes to its General Assembly, we meet with 40 heads of state foreign ministers. Why?
I think I got it. It's like a poker game in which Foxman bluffs the other side into thinking that Jews have more influence and power in Washington than they really have. The downside is that the idea of Jews being so powerful can result in envy, even hate. Foxman has a very close relationship with the Israeli government. Israel relies on Foxman when it comes to issues of anti-Semitism. And being the Jewish state, anti-Semitism is always on the agenda. Hi, Abe. What we, I wanted to ask you since we met last about the uh, issue of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there were, I heard voices kind of saying it's not so bad, and Latin America is not so bad, but... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not convinced, and the question is... You have is good what? reason not to be convinced. <coughs> you have good reason. It is getting worse. Why? Um, and little by little, as long as oil money works. I'm told that uh, by our experts, it's the only, except for Iran, yeah. it's the only government propagated anti-Semitism today around the world. It's a Formally, real. right. This is First quite scary. within the country and then outside. So are you pressing in any way? We've talked to um, uh, Jesse Jackson. Right. There's a relationship, but um, it's not for camera, but right. there are other plans. We'll talk about it in a minute. So it is, we have a very beautiful view here. The first example of what Foxman is talking about was a meeting with a special advisor to the Ukrainian president, Yushchenko. The Ukrainian government would like to distance itself from the embrace of the Russians and strengthen its ties with the West, most especially the United States. They believe that the Jews can become their allies in the U.S. Congress. Um, we come to celebrate your democracy, but we also come with mixed feelings. The history of the Jewish people in this country is primarily one of tragedy. We would like to see a more uh, active, a more aggressive um, approach to dealing with issues of anti-Semitism. It took a long Foxman is concerned about the Ukrainian government's comparison of the famine in the Ukraine before World War II with the Holocaust. The one thing that you need to be sensitive about is not to link it with the Holocaust. I, I know. Be careful that it not be played as your genocide, our genocide because that will be counterproductive on all sides. We, of course, uh, respect Holocaust, and uh, I understood your message, and uh, we try to be very, very diplomatic. Here it is. I was impressed by the way Foxman handled the meeting, but it also raised some questions for me. He was kind of what? Pushing him. Yes, of course. It's always like that? Yeah? Of course. I wasn't sure how bringing up things that had happened over 60 years ago had any relevance to fighting anti-Semitism today. In order to combat it effectively, I think that you have to take responsibility for anything that happened in the past and then reach the present and then go forward. With your husband, when you quarrel, yes. sometimes you need to give some slack to get uh, no. what you want. No, no, no. no. You I bring start? up everything from the past. Fifty years, what his mother did. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. No, that's not. That's not that the American the Jewish, Jewish way. <laughs> I don't know about the Israeli Jewish way. Even the guilt trip. That's yeah, absolutely. We need to play on that guilt. I asked when you have a quarrel, when whether she give you some slack sometimes to you know to make up, but uh, she said no. I'm always wrong, and she's always right. But wait a minute, do I ever forget anything in the past? Never, never, never. Suzanne will tell me twenty years ago what I did wrong. If we have an argument now. But, you know, 20 years you did this. I said, but Suzanne, it was 20 Wait years. Wait a minute. But do you know why? Because 
he has not stood up and taken responsibility for that behavior. The guilt trip she's giving you, does it help? No. So maybe the guilt trip we're giving them is not the right solution. Maybe we should like give them some slack and say, okay, let's be friends. Not forget the past, but kind of be a little bit more, uh, you know, liberal. moderate. Yeah. You the know guilt, something we happen to. I have to the guilt of the father should not be visited on the guilt of the son, on the sons, and it's true. Of course, it's true. I agree with you. It's true. You have to. Yeah. You, you cannot can. let it go down, but you can't keep playing on it as heavily as some people do. It's got to be moderate. But the ADL is like one of the people who plays quite heavily. No, no, we're ADL. moderate. No, ADL plays heavily. There is not a speech. I'm feeling. There is not a speech. You're going to show me. No, no, be careful. I'm not talking to him. I'm not talking to him. What is he? What are you, the facade or something? Shut up. I was fortunate. I was I'm passionate, believe me. Quite as much. I could understand Abe's sensitivity to the Holocaust being a survivor and was moved by the support he received from the ADL mission members. But the film I wanted to make is about anti-Semitism today. And I decided to explore on my own an incident I had read about in the papers. In Moscow, a man with a knife had entered the synagogue and had started stabbing people. The incident was recorded on the security cameras. The stabbing was a shocking reminder of what anti-Semitism can be. I thought I should speak with the members of the synagogue to see how they felt about their own safety. I didn't understand. How come these religious Jews who go to the synagogue every day and are such easy targets for anti-Semites don't seem so concerned about the personal safety? I decided to ask the local rabbi in Kiev about it. The truth is that uh, for some reason secular Jews are more worried about anti-Semitism than religious Jews, if you noticed. Um, it's, it's not that way, it's just that uh, on their agenda of being Jewish, anti-Semitism is not part of being Jewish for an Orthodox Jew. Part of being Jewish is not fighting anti-Semitism. Part of being Jewish is practicing Judaism. Uh, there's no mitzvah in the Torah when you practice Judaism to fight anti-Semitism. Uh, at the same time, fighting anti-Semitism anti -Semitism is something that's important for the Jewish people, for, the, you know, for Jewish communities throughout the world. And very often, uh, people that are not practicing, like you say, that's where they find their thing. So they'll, you know, express their Jewish identity in a way that they'll be fighting anti-Semitism and thereby helping the community, in, you know, in its fight for anti-Semitism. The rabbi said that it is actually an issue of identity. I wanted to know if Suzanne and Harvey Prince would agree with this theory. Yeah, I mean, you can't film this because, you know... Yes. <laughs> I do think that the ADL helps to reinforce our Jewish identity because we're not 
Orthodox, and we don't have a religious Jewish life, the ADL provides a forum to be Jewish. I mean, it certainly is 99.9% .9 Jewish, and it gives us an opportunity to explore being Jewish, to look at Jewish issues, and it does reinforce our Jewish identity. Babi Yar, in the suburbs of Kiev, is a mass grave in which 33,771 Jews were shot after digging their own grave over the course of just two days in September 1941. I think the worst thing for me, standing here, is that it could happen today. Yeah. Oh, God. I agree. Yeah. I can see people being marched out of Kiev and shot Maryland. by some, some people who would decide that's the thing to do. That's right. Maybe they do it to gays. Maybe they do it to... That's why we have to support Israel. Israel's our insurance policy. If it was a question of the continuing existence of Israel, would you move to Israel? Yes, in a minute. Good for you, I tend to say. In a minute. As far as I'm concerned, without Israel, there isn't a safe Jew in the world. That's the way I feel. I agree. I agree. So you have two people who immediately move to Israel if you have a problem. Right. If Israel needs, you, you have know, two people right I joined there. the army, they wouldn't take an old lady, but I would be right. there. <laughs> So I'd roll bandages. He's asking, I don't know. He's asking a question. So is, is, is that mean that you're more loyal to Israel then? No. Of course not. That's right. So how of course you, how, not. How do you like co coexist these two notions? How do I like what? How these two notions coexist? The fact that... Easy. You love your children, you love your husband. You love your friends equally. Do you love your children more than you love your husband? Of course not. Sometimes. But sometimes. You, might, you might die for your children before you, know, you would die for your husband. It's like the question. That you might. You were in a so life Israel is the husband or the kids? I'm sorry? Israel is the husband or the kids? The kids. The kids. The kids. The kids. Yeah. The love for Israel, for, the for Israel is love for a child. There's a love for a child that different than a love for a husband. There's nothing right. like a really a love for a child. It's a much more protective. Love. Right. No, no, it's it's a much more. Uh... <laughs> okay. According to the ADL mission members, Israel is a child which needs their support, but is also their insurance policy in case something terrible should ever happen again. But at this particular moment, this insurance policy was busy being a teenager making its way to Maidane concentration camp near Lublin. השלב הבא של תשומת הלב, אנחנו מגיעים למיידניק. Brigitte Brigitte 
רוכבת על גבי סוס, באזור המקסים הזה של לובלין, עם שוד ברזל שמחובר אליו כל מיני ברזלים ו... ו... כאילו, כמו שאתם רואים לפעמים בסרטים של המלחמות, ופשוט עוברת על גבי אסירים ו... ומכה אותם. סתם ככה? סתם ככה. אוקיי? בריז'יטה צמאת אדם שהייתה מפקדת זה. עכשיו, כמו שהסברתי קודם, שליש מהנרצחים פה נרצחו בגז, ושני שליש פחות או יותר נרצחו על ידי התת-תנאים שהם היו צריכים לחיות פה. לכו על זה. עדי, מה אתם מדברות? מאוכזבות לעצמנו. למה? הוא קצת קשה להקל. זהו, אנחנו מסתכלים על זה ואני מסתכלת על This was my first time in Maidanek as well, and I could relate to the way the kids felt. The horrors were almost impossible to digest. But the kids just couldn't accept the fact that they wouldn't become emotional after all the preparation they'd been through. לרגש ולדעת מה היה כאן. אני חושבת ש... ש... לא יודעת, אני, אני לא מספיק בזה. בסדר, אוקיי. אני לא מספיק במצא את עצמי במצא. את לא צריכה, אבל את לא. אני רק ההתחלה, אוקיי. מה? קחי את הזמן שלך. את לא צריכה, את לא צריכה להרגיש רע עם עצמך שאת לא מצטמרת כל הזמן. אני מרגישה רע עם עצמי שאני מרגישה שאני לא ממצא את עצמי. לא, אבל אז אני אומר עוד פעם. את חווה עכשיו הרבה דברים. תני לעצמך את הזמן, זה מה שאני מבקש. לא יותר מזה. ובאמת, אני נותן לך טיפ שתמשיך לעקוב אחרי הגברת בהמשך, אוקיי? בסדר, תמשיך, תמשיך. יאללה, גיא, עירוני א', אנחנו ממשיכים, בואו. ופה, ללא טקס קבורה וללא כבוד אחרון, נשרפו, נשרפו מושמדי פה בתנורים האלה. העפר שלהם שימש לדישון אחר כך לגרמנים. הם ניצלו, ניצלו את, ה, את היהודי מהעבודה שהוא נכנס במחנה העבודה. It occurred to me that after seeing the almost incomprehensible horrors my people have suffered, other people's suffering might seem less significant somehow. I wondered if any of the kids felt this way too. שיש לנו את הרף הגבוה הזה, ופתאום אנחנו רואים בחדשות שהרסו נגיד לערבי את הבית, שצה"ל פוזל, אז אנחנו רואים, לא נורא, לנו היה דברים יותר גרועים, אותנו לקחו ברכבות וגרמו ליהודים לראות ביהודים. זה כבר נראה לנו, יכול להיות שזה... אני דווקא חושב שאני אחרי... כי וואלה שאני סליחה. כי וואלה שאני רואה את זה בטלוויזיה, זה לא מפריע לי, כי אני כאילו אומרת, בסדר, לא נורא, הערבים האלה יש להם הרבה בעיות. Nofar was not the only one thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in relation to anti-Semitism. Professor Norman Finkelstein, a Jewish academic from DePaul University in Chicago, has written a book called The Holocaust Industry, in which he accuses parts of the Jewish establishment of making cynical political use of the Holocaust. Dr. Finkelstein, you have some visitors? Whenever Israel faces a public relations debacle or comes under pressure to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict, they start up this uh, extravaganza called the new anti-Semitism. As it's usually understood, anti-Semitism means an irrational hatred of Jews born simply of the fact that they are Jewish. But that's not what's going on. Here it's a hostility born of the fact that the state which claims to represent them is engaged in quite brutal violence. I'm sure lots of people I meet have this, what you say, 
deep, you know, deep down inside, they have this kind of queasy feeling about Jews. I'm sure that's true. But did it have any real sub substantial repercussions on me in life? The answer is just no. There's a kind of pathological narcissism, naval contemplation. When you are the richest, wealthiest, most successful ethnic group in the United States, you've got the world on a platter, and you sit around and you're talking about anti-Semitism. It's just kind of shameful, I think. At the time I first interviewed Finkelstein, I didn't realize what a controversial figure he was in the eyes of the Jewish establishment. Finkelstein, the son of Holocaust survivors, has been labeled a self-hating Jew, a Holocaust denier, and a madman. I had interviews stopped at the very mention of his name. I know if you Google Norman Finkelstein and Holocaust denier, nowadays you'll get about 10,000 websites. Well, if I'm a Holocaust denier, if I'm a Holocaust denier, I would have to be certifiably insane. I would have to be clinically insane because given who my parents were, for me to be denying the Nazi Holocaust, I'd have to be clinically insane. So you have to judge for yourself. You may disagree with me, but is it your impression that I'm clinically insane? Now, if you think I'm not, then you have to wonder, why are those 10,000 websites saying that? Recently, you know, there's this talk about uh, the new anti-Semitism, which is very related to Israel. And I've been heard that from Jews outside of Israel, saying uh, Israel is the cause that anti-Semitism is now, uh, that we are suffering from anti-Semitism. Well, I, I would say that is nonsense. That comes from insecure Jews. Um, I think um, people use Israel as an excuse to rationalize and legitimize, because in many places of the world, anti-Semitism is, is not acceptable. It's not, it's not polite, it's not proper. But if you can camouflage it, if you can find a platform of, of a news event, of a political discourse, then you use it. And we find every time there is a conflict in the Middle East between Israel and somebody else, the level of anti-Semitism spikes. Why? Because the anti-Semites come out of their woodwork and now they can express themselves in their anti-Semitism in, in what they consider a legitimate, uh, licensed way. Strangely uh, enough, Foxman and Finkelstein agreed on one thing, which is that most anti-Semitic incidents nowadays fall under the category of new anti-Semitism. The difference is that Foxman says that anti-Semites found a new target called Israel to which they could express their anti-Semitism. Well, Finkelstein believes that saying that is a cynical misuse of the term anti-Semitism. But attacks on the ADL seem to be coming from all directions. So today in America, there are two professors who are saying that Jews are more loyal to Israel than to America. Uh, Mearsheimer and Wald. See, this is what Pat Mearsheimer and Wald. Mearsheimer and Wald. Steve Wald and John Mearsheimer are two academics from the universities of Harvard and Chicago who wrote a book called The Israeli Lobby. They claim that there is a lobby in the U.S. whose role is to support Israeli policy even if this policy goes against the interests of the U.S. The role of the ADL in this lobby is to silence those who criticize Israeli policy, saying they are actually anti-Semites in disguise. Walt and Mearsheimer were invited to Israel by Gush Shalom, a left-wing Israeli organization whose head is Uri Avneri, a former parliament member and a peace activist. I was very happy that they accepted our invitation and agreed to come here. Actually, they, we were a little bit afraid in the beginning that there may be some difficulty to get them into Israel, especially after what happened to Professor Norman Finkelstein, who has been arrested and kept, kept in prison, actually, and then deported. Steve and I have traveled all over the United States, and we've traveled all over Europe, talking about the lobby. I have honestly been struck 
by how little evidence we've come across of anti-Semitism. This is not to say that we don't run into lots of people who are critical of Israeli policy and shake their head at what the Israelis are doing. But as Israelis, it's not good for us to do this. The question is, what are we doing here? 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 כאשר הייתה ממשלה שמאלית כאילו, היחסים היו רעים מאוד. ההתלהבות צמחה. קבלות מאחורי הארגון הזה הן קבלות טובות, לא הבנתי שזו מטרה טובה. אני כבר לא יודע, לא בטוח. אני כבר לא יודע, אני לא יודע מי משרת פה את מי. אנחנו אותם או הם אותנו. אם הם כופ... אנחנו מכתיבים להם מדיניות או שהם, כמו שאמרת קודם, או שהם מכתיבים לנו מדיניות. אף אחד מהם לא לוחם אנטישמיות. הם לוחמים נגד ביקורת על ישראל. זה שני דברים לחלוטין שונים. כמעט שאין אנטישמיה באמריקה, זה, זה אגדה. אין, ממש אין. לו, לו הייתה, זה... גם השתולה הייתה מתנהגת אחרת. אין, אין. התופעה הזאת שנקראת אנטישמיות היא קיימת רק בתקשורת הישראלית, ועל ידי כל מיני פונקציונרים יהודים בעולם שהם מתפרנסים מזה, שהם לוחמים באנטישמיות. איפה יש אנטישמיות? אין כלום. מעולם ישראל, מצבה של היהודים באמריקה, מצבם לא היה כמו היום. מה, אנטישמיות זה המצאה הישראלית? המצאה היהודית? אנטישמיות? אנטישמיות היום? מידה רבה, כן. כל אחד פוחד מאנטישמיות בגלל הזיכרונות ההיסטוריים, והיהודים מפוחדים תמיד. באמריקה היהודים, כמה שהם חזקים וכמה שהם מושלים באמריקה למעשה, הם פוחדים מהצד של עצמם, וכל רגע, אחרי כל עץ, מסתתי אנטישמיות. בולשיט, אין דבר כזה. אנטי ערבים, אנטי מוסלמים, אנטי שחורים, אנטי... מה שאתה רוצה. אנטישמים? פשוט אתה צריך זכוכית מגדלת שנמצא אותם, ויש כאלה שהולכים עם זכוכית מגדלת, כמו שיאלק הולמס, ומוצאים אנטישמים. אייב פוקסמן ספוקסמן, אריו סליבן, היה האחרון שאני חושבת לראות את האבנט. מה היה הוא עושה פה? אני הדובר של הליגה. מי אתה? אתה בארץ? כן, אתה מגוש. אתה מגוש שלום? למה הגעתם אותו? את מי? את שניהם. זאת אומרת, למה הבאנו אותו? אנחנו חושבים, אנחנו חושבים שמה שהאנשים האלה עושים זה פשוט פעולה הכי מבורכת שיכולה להיות. לא לגבי השמצה או לא השמצה. לגבי אי פעם להגיע למצב נורמלי ומאוזן באזור הזה. יש לכם כסף להביא אנשים כאלה פה? אמרו לי שגוש שלום זה ארגון קטן, שולי כזה. גוש שלום זה ארגון קטן. אבל את הקצת כסף שיש לו, הוא מנצל לדברים החשובים ביותר. והדברים החשובים ביותר זה להגיע סוף סוף אי פעם לאיזשהו פיוס בין הפלסטינים לבין היהודים במזרח התיכון. והדרך היחידה לעשות את זה, זה לגרום שהמדיניות של מי שתומך בישראל, לא משנה מה היא עושה, שהמדיניות הזאת תתחיל להיות קצת יותר נורמלית. זה לא מקרה שהאנשים האלה הוציאו ספר שכל העולם רעש ורגש בגללו. At the annual ADL convention, the Israeli lobby book was the center of attention. In the foreign office in Israel, there was a three-day convention dealing mostly with the issues raised in the book, The Israeli Lobby. Never before had the question of whether anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are the same thing seemed so important. Experts and speakers from all over the world said the same thing. 
that those who attack Israel are doing so simply because they are anti-Semites in disguise. We thought people who would hate us, who would be our enemies, would be thugs and lunatics yelling kike, and instead they're soft-spoken college professors explaining to us how, how we have the apartheid state. We were unprepared. So let this conference draw a line in the sand. If you're an enemy of the Jewish people, then we will fight you with all our might for ourselves and for our children and for our children's children. Who would we be if we did not? And we will prevail. After three days, something happened which was more or less the equivalent of a bomb being thrown into the room. If you came down from space, you would think, having looked at this conference, that there was absolutely no problem in the West Bank or in Gaza. One element of the reason why so many people around the world are angry with Israel is because of the continuing settlement and occupation of Palestinian land and because Israel, which has state power, has not done enough to end the occupation. One of the reasons. Such an occupation cannot be sustained without racism, without violence, and without humiliation against the people who are occupied. Thank you. It, I, I don't get it. I just don't get it unless you were ironic. Yes. We, I, we appreciate your work, we invited you to speak, yes. but what you did today was a kind of a preaching about looking for human rights that we don't have. This is more or less what you said. We there, have there are to problems with human rights in, in the we territory. Don't say it's that, what do you say? No, not I choose to say something which has not yet been said by everybody. Just it's for very the simple. No, not for the provocation, because Palestine was not mentioned it was in this mentioned conference. All not over. once, maybe by Gil. It was mentioned. It was mentioned yesterday over. as Palestine is all the anti-nation. Palestine is the one unique nation which doesn't have the right to exist. It was oh, mentioned. No, no one said it. Oh, oh, Come on. oh, oh, oh. Come on. No one said it. Kirsten Field said it. Palestine no is the anti-nation. What do you think that means? And where do you think that terminology comes from? The anti-nation. What you were saying is that anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are two different things. They are two different things. No, sometimes they are the same thing. And it's kind of ironic, really, that I was seen by some people as a sort of wild-eyed radical, because where I come from, I'm denounced as a right-wing, neocon, Israeli-supporting, anti-Palestinian racist. Um, what does it say about this conference then? Well, it says about this conference that there were some hard right wingers there. Um, there you go. <laughs> Nobody in this conference was balanced, not one. I don't think so. Speaking with David Hirsch made me realize that it is very difficult to represent any other approach in the Jewish world. Those who try to say anything different are being silenced. And Dina has a go at me for not being balanced. You're, no, you're, you're hinted too much. You were not explicit enough. Should have more defined what time I mean. Hirsch was right. The occupation as a possible reason for justified criticism was not mentioned. Many Jewish people see anti-Semitism as a force of nature. It has always been there and will always be there. It will just take on different shapes and forms. I find this difficult to accept. This is a conference about people around the world blaming Jews as the worst human rights violators on the planet. And the people who support Israel are now under attack as supporting the colonialist apartheid state of Israel. This is a warrant for attack on Jewish people. It is internationally recognized that anti-Zionism is sometimes anti-Semitism. You know what? And who as, as, he an Isra as an Israeli, can this is the only thing that leaves me hope to differentiate these two. Why? Because otherwise there is no hope. 
Otherwise, this is a doomed. But this is closing this your is eyes. This is a doomed, you, you're right. uh, fatalistic uh, but approach, you're closing your which gives us no hope so, at so all. No, no, no but no. you see what he, what he's hey. doing. But he's do, he's doing exactly the the pro, he has the problem of the left. And here's the problem. Oh. Here's the problem. You you yeah. this analysis. This is just like the wife who's beaten by her husband, who goes to the psychiatrist and she says it must be something I did because if it's not something I did, then it's hopeless. Then he's a madman. Well, you need to find something you did to cause the hatred against you. But guess what? It's nothing that you did, and it's too bad. You are in chaos, and the world is dangerous, and Islamism, funded by the Saudis, is teaching gazillions of people around the world that you are evil before you came to Israel. So this is your problem. You're exactly right, and you don't want that to be true. Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm just naive. Maybe all those people who criticize Israel really are anti-Semites in disguise. I'm heading to Chicago to speak with John Mirsheimer, co-author of the Israeli lobby. I hope to have the courage to ask him if he's really an anti-Semite in disguise. Yeah. And, but did, did you like kind of like took a few minutes to question yourself when you've been blamed as being anti-Semite? Like did you try to think about it like, you know? Between yourself and yourself, you know, like, I don't know if you have this expression, like within yourself, like, did you take some moment to think maybe some of it was like influenced by, by something which is, you know, could be interpreted as like anti-Semitism? Anti no, because I'm not anti-Semitic and I, I never uh, had any doubt uh, that I wasn't anti-Semitic and uh, I just didn't see any need. To do this, uh, my arguments are not in any way, shape, or form hostile to Jews or hostile to the state of Israel. And in fact, Steve Walt and I go to great lengths in the books to make the in the book and, and in the article to make the case uh, that we think the lobby's policies are not in Israel's interest or in America's interest. And we believe uh, that the policies that we're pushing and the arguments that we're making are better for Israel and better for the United States. Now, one can disagree with that, but uh, those arguments that we're making are not anti-Semitic and we're not anti-Semites. Of course, it's almost impossible to prove that you're not an anti-Semite, which is one reason that this charge is so effective. I mean, how does one say... Uh, I'm not anti-Semitic and convince people who say you are. My best friend is a... Right, that's what you end up saying, that uh, my best friends are Jews. And some of my best friends are Jews, and of course this is not a very convincing argument. In I'm fact, it's right. an argument that's almost guaranteed to lose. There's no question that anti-Semitism has been uh, a poisonous uh, and potent uh, phenomenon over time. And there's no question that someone like uh, Abe Foxman, who grew up uh, as an infant and a young boy in Europe during the Holocaust, is going to be affected by that history of anti-Semitism. They say that eventually it's bad for Israel as well, not only for the United States, but this policy eventually will be bad for Israel as well. But that's not their goddamn business. Who the hell asked them to decide what's good for you? You know, who, who are they? Who are they who come to a judgment what will provide safety and security for you? Keep in your mind. That's not their business. Look, I have, um, I have an obsession in this place with one thing, which I am, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, we need to find a way. The latest battle Abe Foxman had taken upon himself against the anti-Semitic Polish dolls made me realize that his devotion to Israel is only part of the overall picture. Traditional Jew, I would say even um, stereotypic Jew, um, holding a, a bag of money and a zloty. It's a good luck charm to buy people if they go into a new house or business because the Jews are so good with money. It is disgusting. It is disgusting. And now, in the, in the economic crisis, you want to know how serious Jews and money is? Jews are money. Is that what you want? But somebody's losing money. It's not a bad thing, you know, to... to, to you know, you know what? We're in Auschwitz. That's, those are the things that pave the stones to lead to Auschwitz. Because if Jews have money, you can get rid of the Jews, you can get their money. What kind of a good thing is that? 
Foxman is like a very sensitive radar for Jewish issues. The memory of the Holocaust is always in the background, like a warning sign of what can happen if things are not dealt with at the right time. I want to ask you a question. Look over here. Do you see a Holocaust coming? It's crazy. There's so much hunger, so much starvation in the world. So many people are suffering. And you want me to get excited about some idiot painting a swastika somewhere? Finkelstein lost his job at the university because of what he claims was pressure from the Israeli lobby. Then he was denied entry to Israel because he was, as the authorities described, a security hazard, which being Jewish himself is probably unprecedented. Finkelstein reminds me of the biblical prophets of doom, who were always being pelted with stones for saying things nobody wanted to hear. One of the major kind of uh, um, claims I, I, I hear from people like the ADL or you know other Jewish people is that like, how come always picking, people picking up on Israel. How come there are so much, you know, injustice, mm -hmm. you know, in other parts of the world and nobody speaks about, you know? Mm -hmm. what, what is the reason I for that? I think people, listen, I open the radio, I hear non-stop about Sudan. I hear non-stop about Tibet. I hear non-stop about Darfur. I hear a lot. The only place I hear excuses made for is Israel. That's the place where I hear excuses. And we do have to remember, it is the oldest occupation in the world. I mean, 40 years really is enough. It's older than you. It's older than you, the occupation. Doesn't that kind of stun you? The irony is that the Nazi Holocaust has now become the main ideological weapon for launching wars of aggression. Every time you want to launch a war of aggression, drag in the Nazi Holocaust. It's the suffering then used as another pretext or excuse to humiliate, degrade, and torture the Palestinians. That's the problem. The suffering comes as a package. It then comes, here is the suffering, now we blow up your house. Here is the suffering, now we take your land. Here is the suffering, now we drop artillery shell or shoot artillery shells at your villages. It's a package deal with Israel and its American supporters. It's not just suffering, it's suffering which is then wrapped in a club. And the club is then used to break the skulls of the Palestinians. That's the problem. It's not being used to educate people. It's not being used to enlighten people. It's not being used to make people more moral. It can be. But it's not. I mean... It's not. That's the whole point. Of course it can be, but it isn't. It's the best thing that will ever happen to Israel if they get rid of these American Jews who are warmongers from Martha's Vineyard. And they're warmongers from the Hamptons and they're warmongers from Beverly Hills, and they're warmongers from Miami. It's been a disaster for Israel. You know, it's the best thing if they can ever get rid of this American jury. It's a curse. For Finkelstein, Foxman is the main enemy. <laughs> you see, that's why you're not going to get like, people's attention, you know, for things like that. Some people laugh. You comparing Foxman to Hitler, that's kind of... Uh... Uh, it's, too, it's an insult to Hitler. Hitler at least didn't do it for money. Finkelstein took his own trauma as the son of Holocaust survivors to the opposite extreme. When I asked him if he had any sympathy for the Israeli victims as well as for the Palestinians, he compared Israeli casualties to the German casualties in World War II. You know, funny, I have to tell you, you're funny. Like you come that. from a society in which everyone calls everyone a Nazi, right? They call Rabin a Nazi, Ben-Gurion called Jabotinsky a Nazi, Jabotinsky called Ben-Gurion a Nazi, uh, Begin called uh, Ben-Gurion a Nazi. They all said, each of them said, one is worse than Hitler, 
That's the whole language of how your society. It's also the language I grew up with. You know, everything in my house, the food worse than Auschwitz, the clothes worse than that. That's the house you grow up in. And all of a sudden, you get so pious when I go like that. Your whole society is like that. Why was Rabin? You don't remember when they made Rabin with the SS before he was shot? And then you all of a sudden get so pious. I just think about like how people... Be because of what? Because of Abe Foxman? We have to be pious with Abe Foxman? A hoodlum and a thug? I'm just trying to see, to think how other people would perceive it, you know, for myself, you know, you can go and do it all day long, you know. I did it with you, you're in Israel. You yeah, but understand. it's on film, you know, it's on film, you know, other people will see it afterwards. Then take it out! That's why you're an editor. No, that's obviously, you know, should stay in the film, <laughs> you know, that's... Fine. You think I care? You think I care? So you like the neighborhood? Very much. Look at the breeze. The last time I was with Foxman was in Auschwitz. The Israeli army sends its officers on a Poland trip similar to the one the kids are going through. This year, for the first time ever, an ADL mission became an integral part of the Israeli Defense Force mission. Marching next to Foxman is the deputy chief of staff the second in command of the Israeli army. On Foxman's left is the Israeli ambassador to Poland. אנחנו מנציחים את המוות, ואנחנו בכך לא הופכים לעם נורמלי. זה שאנחנו שמים דרגש על המוות ועל מה שקרה, וצריך לזכור, אין, ללא שום ספק, אנחנו יותר מדי חיים בתוך זה, וזה גורם לנו לא להיות, זה גורם לנו לא להיות עם נורמלי, זה גורם לנו להיות עם... זה גורם לנו להיות... מה, נרצחו עשרים וכמה חבר'ה? פולנים, כאן בחצר הזו, אז אל תשבו על האנדרטה בבקשה. ורוב הסיכויים שנרצחה בבית החולים בקייב על ידי הנאצים. יהי זכרה ברוך. היו 
הרבה מזוודות, שעל כל מזוודה היה רשום שם. מה היו בגדים של תינוקות? כפפות, חולצות, מכנסיים. היה הרבה זוגות נעליים של ילדים ושל מבוגרים. היה הרבה סילים, גל חץ לנעליים, מברשות שיניים, כל רכוש קיומי כאילו בסיסי. I've walked, I've walked this road before, full of despair, full of anguish. To walk and feel the strength behind you of 150 officers of all the levels of the Israeli army, I walked with pride. I walked with hope. I hope with strength. את מי באה לרצוח? את כל אלה? מי זה אלה? הנאצים. הצוררים האלה. טוב, הם כבר, את יודעת, הם מתו. כן, אבל תאמין לי שיש להם דורות. אמנם לא כמוהם, אבל יש. My filming was coming to an end. As I looked at the sleeping kids, I thought that putting so much emphasis on the past, as horrific as it has been, is holding us back. Maybe it's about time to live in the present and look to the future.